أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ألف لام م ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone uh, today I'd like to share with you some things that will help you get to know Surah Al-Baqara there are a few very beautiful narrations that I want to go through these are found in Bukhari and Muslim the first one's from Muslim عن زيد أنه سمع أبا السلام يقول حدثني أبو أمام الباهلي قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول اقرأ القرآن so the long chain of narrators, those are the names of the people that I mentioned. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, recite the Qur'an. فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ شَفِيعًا لِأَصْحَابِهِ Because it will come on the day of resurrection as a maker of case, meaning it will come on your behalf, it's pleading on your behalf uh, for, its, for its companion, meaning the one who recited it became its companion. Uh, it's almost as though the Qur'an is personified on Judgment Day. And we'll see that theme continue. اِقْرَأُ الزَّهْرَوَيْنِ Al-Baqarah wa Surah Al-Imran Recite the beautiful glowing Zahrawain Meaning the two beautiful glowing ones The glittering ones uh, Which are Baqarah and Al-Imran فَإِنَّهُمَا تَأْتِيَانِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كَأَنَّهُمَا غَمَامَتَانِ Because both of them will arrive on Judgment Day As they're both, you know, uh, happy clouds or puffy clouds You know, on the Day of Judgment There's this intense exposure And humanity standing before Allah and Allah Azza wa give, and the idea of ghamam, if you study Surah Al-Baqarah itself, Allah will describe that the, de- the Israelites were out in the desert and they were going to die in the scorching sun. And Allah sent ghamam, clouds that gave them shade. So there's scary clouds, but these are not scary clouds. These are actually, you can say, white, puffy, happy clouds. And they take that, that kind of image and they come and hover over the people that used to recite them. This is important also because in another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, we learn that on the Day of Judgment, there is no shade except for a small group of people. In other words, people are going to be seeking shade on Judgment Day. When the entire sky is torn open, فَإِذًا شَقَّتِ السَّمَاءِ فَكَانَتْ وَرْدَةً كَالْدِّهَانِ You know, يُرْسَلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَشُوَاظٌ مِّنْ نَارٍ سُوَةُ الرَّحْمَانِ You know, the, the sky will be ripped open. There's going to be meteors falling onto the earth. People are going to be looking for a place to find refuge. And here you have people of the of, of Baqarah and Ali Imran, and two clouds are hovering over them, providing them security. SubhanAllah. أَوْ كَأَنَّهُمَا غَيَايَةً or it is, is as though that they are غَيَايَةً غَيَايَةً وَهِيَ بِالْبَائِينَ بِالْيَائِينَ مَا يَكُونُ أَدْوَنَ مِنْهُمَا فِي الْكَثَافَةِ وَأَقْرَبَ إِلَى رَأْسِ صَحِيبِهِمَا كَمَا يَفْعَلُ بِالْمُلُوكِ فَيَحْسُلُ عِنْدَهُ الظِّلِّ وَالضَّوْءُ جَمِيعًا SubhanAllah, it's so amazing. Clouds are way up there. He, the Prophet ﷺ said, there could be clouds up there. But depending on your closeness with these surahs, those clouds descend down upon you and they're literally right above you. They're just protecting you right, right, right above you. SubhanAllah. They come and they come really close to you. And the image that some of the ulama, this is commentary from scholars on the hadith, um, is that you know how kings, when they're in the in the shade or in the in the sun, when they travel in the sun, and there's a servant kind of putting a, a thing over them so they get shade all the time. They're not completely in the dark, they can see what's going on, but they're also being provided a kind of shade. That's how the surah comes to serve the one who accompanied it. Or it's like two massive flocks of birds that keep hovering around you. Like they're the ones protecting you from anything coming. to جَانِ عَنْ أَصْحَابِهِمَا That are going to make a case on behalf of the people who come accompanied them. SubhanAllah. These birds are there to protect us. And hujja in Arabic is to make a case against someone or to make a conclusive case in favor of someone. In other words, this, these surahs will make a case for us on judgment day like nobody else and you know we're saved because of these surahs. اِقْرَأُوا سُورَةَ الْبَقَرَةَ Then the Prophet said, and after highlighting both of them, then he specifically focused on Baqarah. This is the Prophet's word, Ali Wasalam. Recite Surah Al-Baqarah. فَإِنَّ أَخْذَهَا بَرَكَةً Because holding on to it, is blessing on top of blessing on top of blessing. Baraka means goodness that will continue to grow more than expected. Baraka also means goodness that, that is there to stay. Its effects are going to be residual across your life and they will only multiply. Akhdaha baraka wa tarkaha hasra. And leaving it alone, abandoning the surah is regret. You're going to regret missing out on the goodness that would have come into your life if you didn't have a relationship with Baqarah. Wala tastati'uha al-batala. And 
the, the liars and people that falsify are never going to have any say over it. They're not going to be capable of doing any damage to it or the one who holds on to it. The idea, Al-Batala, like Muawiyah says, that Batala here means sorcerers. People that are jealous, they put an evil eye on somebody or they try to, you know, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff they try to do to somebody, hurt somebody. None of this will have an effect on you if you are holding on to the uh, Surah Al-Baqarah. Batala also means people that try to make you doubt your faith people that try to falsify about you, people that spread lies about you, people that try to hurt your reputation. They try to harm you in any way, Baqarah will protect you. You hold on to this Qur'an and it will be your shield against all of them, especially Surah Al-Baqarah. An Jubair ibn Nufayr, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, qala sami'atu nawas bin sam'an al-Kalabi, yaqul sami'atu nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yaqul, now another narration, this is also found in, uh, in Sahih Muslim, we're going to learn something new about this image now. يُؤْتَى بِالْقُرْآنِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَأَهْلِهِ الَّذِينَ كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ بِهِ تَقْدُمُهُ سُرُطُ الْبَقَرَ وَأَلُوا عِمْرَانِ On the Day of Judgment, the Qur'an will be brought forward. And along, you know, on the Day of Judgment, along with its people, those who, those who used to act on it. And Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran will be leading the front, meaning Qur'an itself is arriving, and in the front of that caravan of the Qur'an is the two surahs, Baqarah and Ali Imran. وَضَرَبَ لَهُمَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ ثَلَاثَةَ أَمْثَالٍ مَا نَسِيتُهُنَّ بَعْد and the Sahabi says that the Prophet gave three examples to help me appreciate what it's going to look like on Judgment Day to describe these surahs coming. I could never forget them. It's as though they are two clouds. We read this already. We heard this already. Or dark sh shadows, dark shades between which there is light coming through. Dark clouds themselves are scary. But when dark clouds are accompanied with light, you have both effects. You, if too much exposure to light will burn you. So you need the, the, the shadows to cover you. But if all you get is shadow, then darkness itself is scary. It's the best of both worlds. That between these two, you're going to be given protection, but not so much that you get overwhelmed by it, light will come through as well. Uh, once again, it's like flocks of birds coming and hovering around, protecting the one and making a case in favor of the one who used to accompany them. May Allah make us from them. Then Abu Huraira's narration, radiallahu anhu, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa qal, la taj'alu buyutakum maqabir. He said, don't make your homes into graves. The Prophet said, don't turn your homes into graves. إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ يَنْفِرُ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي تُقْرَأُ فِيهِ سُرُطُ الْبَقَرَةِ No doubt about it, shaitan runs from the house in which Baqarah is being recited. So the, our homes, to, be, to save our homes from the effect of shaitan, recite Surah Al-Baqarah. And of course, how would you turn a home into a grave? When the hearts are dead. Allah is not talking about zombies. He's not talking about people that are the living dead or something, or people die. No, He's talking about spiritually. Don't let your home spiritually die with the absence of Surah Al-Baqarah. What is in this surah that's so epic that you have narration after narration after narration, and this is the most profound one. I was just blown away by this one. This is in Bukhari. عن أسيد بن حضير قال بينما هو يقرأ من الليل سورة البقرة One night he's reciting سورة البقرة This Sahabi, Usaid وفرسه مربوطة عنده And he's got a horse stable And his horses are all You know, they're tied up Right in his company إذ جالت الفرس فسكت فسكت All of a sudden his horses started acting up When he was reciting So he got quiet And the horses calmed down فَقَرَأَ So he recited Fatiha, recited Baqarah again. فَجَالَتِ الْفَرَسِ The horses started acting up again. فَسَكَتَ وَسَكَتَ الْفَرَسِ And so he stopped reciting and the horses calmed down again. He's like, why do I recite Baqarah and these horses go nuts? ثُمَّ قَرَأَ Then he recited فَجَالَتِ الْفَرَسِ فَانْصَرَفْ So then the, the horses started acting up again. And so he left, he moved back. But then he realized, وَكَانَ إِبْنُهُ يَحْيَىٰ قَرِيبًا مِنْهَا His little boy Yahya, this Sahabi has a little boy Yahya, he's at the stable right by the horses, and the horses are acting up, and he's afraid that they're going to trample him, because they're acting up. فَأَشْفَقَ أَن تُصِيبَهُ So he got really scared that they'll strike him. فَلَمَّا اشْتَرَّهُ رَفَعَ رَأْسَهُ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ So when he pulled his son out, he lifted his head to the sky, and he noticed something in the sky. And he went away until he couldn't see it anymore. So there's two weird things happening. One, the horses are acting funny. He's pulled his kid away. He's looking up and he sees something and he goes far away until he can't see it anymore. So now he comes. Then the next morning came. 
Um, so he told he came to talk to the Prophet ﷺ, but the Prophet ﷺ preempted what he was gonna say. He said, Iqra ya ibn Hudayr, Iqra ya ibn Hudayr. Ibn Hudayr, recite, recite. Like the Prophet's telling him, why'd you stop reciting? Like the Prophet already knows, Ali Salam, that he's gonna tell me about some recitation problem that happened the night before. The Prophet preempts him and says, Keep on reciting, keep on reciting. So he says, Faqal, qal fa ashfaqtu ya Rasulullah an tata'a Yahya. I was really scared that they're gonna trample over my son Yahya. Wakana minha qariba, and he was really close to them. Farafatu rasi, fan saraftu ilayhi. So I raised my head and I just ran over to him and grabbed him. Farafatu rasi ila sama. As I was pulling him away from the horses, I looked up to the sky. Now check this out. Fa'idha mithlu dhullati fiha amthalul basabih. So I see the likes of what looks like shadows. But there are lamps inside the shadows. I can't describe it, it's kind of weird. They're like shades, but they're like lamps at the same time, descending. فَخَرَجَتْ So they started leaving. حَتَّى لَا أَرَاهَا Until I couldn't see them anymore. And the Prophet ﷺ says, وَتَدْرِي مَا ذَاك? Do you know what that was? قَالَ لَا He said, no, I don't know. He says, تِلْكَ الْمَلَائِكَ دَنَتْ لِصَوْتِكَ Those were angels that came down because of the beauty of your voice. You were reciting Baqarah and it attracted all kinds of angels. And they started coming down. And the horses would see the angels coming down. And the horses started freaking out because they couldn't handle the sight of angels. And you looked up and you saw these little beacons of light. Those were actually angels. And if you had kept on reciting, the angels would have been so attracted that they would have become visible. They, will, they left the world of the unseen to join the world of the seen just to enjoy your recitation of Baqarah. That's how much it attracts the angels of Allah. And he says, they would have come down so that people could see them. لا تتوارى منهم There would be no barrier left. People could have been able to see, people would have been able to see the angels because of your recitation. SubhanAllah. Then of course, there are so many ayat inside Surah Al-Baqarah that there are narrations about. I won't go into them. Of course, Ayat Al-Kursi is a thing by itself, right? There's so much that's been said about Ayat Al-Kursi. But I'll tell you what the last two ayahs of Baqarah, which will benefit you immediately, inshallah. The Prophet Sallallahu says, Again, muttafaqun alayhi hadith, Man qara'a bil ayatain min akhiri Surah Al-Baqarah fi laylatin kafatahu. If whoever recited the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah in the night time, it's enough for him. That's enough for the person. And that means that this is something very, very beneficial for us to do, to recite and ponder. And by the way, you know, I come from, a, a, you know, Indo-Pak subcontinent culture where we glorify recitation without pondering. When the Prophet ﷺ says, recite this, he doesn't just mean verbatim, just read it without thinking about it. The companions, nobody ever did that. Every time they recited, they were pondering the meanings. Like this is not an artificial chanting kind of relationship with the Qur'an, but a meaningful, deep, thought-provoking relationship with the Qur'an. That's what Allah wants. He doesn't just want us to memorize and chant words. He wants us to engage with these words so they melt our hearts. So they go. In, these words go into our hearts. You know, an acknowledgement of the power of these words. So learn the Qur'an, memorize the Qur'an, recite the Qur'an, but recite it being thoughtful of what it means. That is when these benefits actually come to life. Now what I want to tell you quickly, inshallah, it's just some things about Surah Al-Baqarah. It's the biggest surah of the Qur'an. It's so, so huge. I wanted to go through some of those narrations to tell you some of the merits and you know profound beauties of this surah that the, even from the Prophet's time, والسلام, we should appreciate. But some things you should know about its subject matter. Easily you can divide the surah into nine parts. Okay, so it's a, it's a long surah, 286 ayahs, and nine logical parts. And I want to walk you through what happens in these parts and how they're all kind of connected to each other. Okay, So the first part of the surah is Allah dividing all of you know the, the, the audience of the Qur'an into three groups. The people who engage the Qur'an, they're either going to be people who have faith, people who absolutely reject it, they want nothing to do with it, or people who claim to have faith, but they don't really have faith. Hypocrites. So believers, disbelievers, and hypocrites. This is the first discussion of Surah Al-Baqarah. You can call it part one. In part two, Allah says, well, you know, this idea of people who openly believe, people who openly disbelieve and people who conceal their faith. This is something that's always been the case and actually this legacy of faith, disbelief and hypocrisy, this story started with the story of Adam himself. So the next story is that of Adam السلام, and how he ended up on the earth. And that's, the, that's part two. Beyond part two, we move along in this surah and Allah Azza wa says, just like Adam was chosen as a special creature to take responsibility of the, on the earth, he was actually made a khalifa uh, someone who will pass down a legacy one generation after another as humanity spread enough it was important not just to have one person represent and one person take over responsibility but an entire nation the israelites the children of israel were chosen to be model a model nation under god's guidance 
so they can show the beauty of following God's guidance to all of humanity. That was their responsibility. And there's a long discourse on how Allah gave them that responsibility and that favor over all other nations so they could be that role model and how, he, how they disappointed his expectations. And that's the third part of the Baqarah, the Surah Al-Baqarah. From there, you know, the Israelites, towards the end, you notice that the Israel, Allah highlights that the Israelites are not okay with the Prophet being the Prophet. They felt that this is something that was privileged to the Israelites. Only an Israeli should be a prophet. How come he's a child, he's an Arab? You know, how did an Arab ever receive revelation? So what Allah does is He takes a step back and He starts talking about Ibrahim, Abraham. Why? Because even if you don't have affinity to the Arabs, you should certainly have, the Israelites should certainly have affinity to Ibrahim salam. You'll notice something so far. We started with Adam. When the stories began in the surah, we started with Adam, who's a father. And immediately you talk about a nation. Then we're going to talk about Ibrahim salam. And not too much after, it's going to be the new nation. So father, nation, father, nation is the, the, the correlation that's going on. Another really interesting thing is Adam salam was tested. Right? And he failed that test. And then he was redeemed. The Israelites were tested. And they failed their tests. And they have a chance to be redeemed. Then you have Abraham, who, had, who was tested. But he passed all of his tests. And finally you're going to get to the Ummah. And Allah is going to say, I'm going to test you. He tells us, I'm going to be testing you. Let's see how you do. Let's see if you make the mistake that Adam made. Or do you go down the path of the Israelites, keeping making mistakes? Or are you going to live up to the legacy of your father Abraham, who was able to pass through all of the tests? So that's how things are now connected to each other. When Ibrahim is talked about, it's amazing that Allah takes half the passage and talks about his son Ismail, and the other half and talks about his son, grandson Yaqub, Jacob, whose other name is Israel. Why was that important? Because Allah is saying both of these are legitimate lineages of Abraham. And both of them were Muslim. He uses the word Muslim from both of their tongues. So you understand that what the Prophet is calling you towards is very true and very original to the Abrahamic message. And when you, the Israelites, are rejecting the Prophet because he's Arab, you're not being very different from Iblis, from the devil, who rejected Adam because he's made of clay. So don't go down that road. Accept him. And as, as this was done, then we switch over to what this father, now that he's got two lineages, he's going to leave a legacy behind, an institution behind. What is that institution? He built the Kaaba. He built this house in the middle of the desert. And as he built that house, he prayed for a prophet to come. And now the Israelites are being told, Muhammad Wasallam is the answer to the prayer of your own father Abraham. He's the answer to your own father's prayer. He's the fulfillment of his own legacy. You should take ownership and you should have loyalty to the Prophet Muhammad just as you do to Abraham. So, and, and then they recognize the change of the Kaaba because the Prophet stopped praying towards Jerusalem. And now because of these ayat, that's the fifth subject of the surah, the change towards the Kaaba. And beyond the Kaaba, now that the capitals have shifted, used to be that we, we, we prayed towards Jerusalem. So it was almost like even the Jews felt like we're not that different. But now we're praying towards Mecca. This is totally different. They're a new nation now. And Allah inaugurates us as a new nation. Kuntum khayra ummatin Actually, that's coming in Ali Imran. But even now, kadhalika ja'annakum ummatan wasata. We made you a middle nation. You're a new nation now. You stand on your own. The Muslim ummah, the ya ayyuhalladhina amanu starts getting used. Those of you who believe. Those of you who believe. That's the official address to the Muslim ummah. And you know, when you have a new nation, you need to have a capital, which is our Kaaba. Then you need to have, you know, your inauguration ceremony. Like, you know, nations have Independence Day. We were given Independence Month, Quran Month, Ramadan. That was revealed in the surah. The rituals of that house were revealed in the surah. The name of this ummah was revealed. Its prophet was given, you know. So all we, we are basically now turned into a new independent ummah that is going to go through their own trials. That's the next subject matter. Beyond that, interestingly enough, it's a long passage of Surah Al-Baqarah that mentions a number of different laws and regularities. And these laws have to do with fasting, with hajj, divorce law is mentioned, social law is mentioned, some, some preliminary inheritance law is mentioned, you know, uh, uh, zakat is mentioned, all kinds of laws dealing with each other, taking care of orphans, things like that. All of these kinds of things are mentioned in this incredible systematic order, which is too long to explain in this session, but at least that's the case. Now let me walk you through where we are so far. We started with believers, disbelievers, and hypocrites. That was section one. Story of Adam was section two. Then section three was the Israelites and how they failed expectations. Section four was they should have lived up, lived up to their legacy of their father Abraham. Speaking of Abraham, he's the one who built the Kaaba. That's section five. Then section six is the, the Muslim Ummah are now a new nation. 
and they are going to be put to the test. In section 7, now what are you going to be tested with? These laws that you have to abide by. So the long section on laws, that's where we are up to section 7. I told you there are nine sections in the surah. In the eighth, moving along, you have the longest passage in the Quran dealing with guidance on greed. Where should you spend your money? Where should you not spend your money? How should you make your money? How should you not make your money? How should you do business? And how should you not do business? Money matters. Just given an exclusive, you know, exhaustive discourse in this surah, unlike any other surah in the entire Quran, that's dealt with. And this is important, by the way, because if you go back to the story of Adam alayhi salam, the problem was greed. And so Allah makes it, makes, makes it a point to know that human beings that have now come to the earth, greed is going to be a big problem. It needs to be dealt with exhaustively. And as we conclude, then we get to the last two, three ayat of Baqarah, which, you know, uh, are the, the one, the, the narration says, whoever recites them at night, it's enough for them. One of the most profound prayers in the entire Quran. And those prayers actually tie up the entire surah. It actually wraps up where we began. Because at the end of the surah, we're basically asking Allah not to put a burden on us like the one He placed on the people before us because they weren't able to bear that burden and they ended up being hypocritical with it. We're asking Allah to save our faith and not be hypocrites and then we end, aid us against the disbelievers. You recall the first subject was believers, disbelievers and hypocrites. The last is a prayer, Ya Allah, secure our faith, we've believed. Don't let it fall into hypocrisy and aid us against disbelievers. So it's actually almost a reaction to where the surah began. And in doing so, it sums up pretty much the entire religion of Islam. One of the most profound surahs of the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ said about the first seven surahs of the Qur'an, that whoever holds on to them, فَهُوَ hibr. He's actually a scholar. Like you don't, It's like you don't need more knowledge than the first seven surahs. Then you have profound, profound knowledge, you know. So may Allah Azza wa Jal make us appreciate the power, the organization, and the, the incredible lessons of Surah Al-Baqarah. I've been trying to study Surah Al-Baqarah maybe for 15 years, and I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us appreciate the power and the, the, uh, the benefits of reflecting and pondering over the Qur'an. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.